Hello! In today's Bug Bounty Report Explained, you will learn how it was possible to hack Facebook in not one, but three different ways. Those vulnerabilities were submitted across two reports, for which the researcher Ala Abdul Rija got $55,000 in total. Links to the original blog posts are in the description. Enjoy! So there were two blog posts by the same author. In part 1, he found an application legal.tapprd.thefacebook.com. There was no registration, but he found a hidden endpoint safe password, which allowed him to take over arbitrary account. From JavaScript files, he prepared a valid body and then brute force the list of usernames. The endpoint allowed changing anyone's password provided that we know their username, so it was complete account takeover. During his brute force, he hit one correct username to prepare the proof of concept. He reported the bug and got $7.5,000 for it. But he wanted more. His idea was to test session management. He had to look into his burp history to see what was going on when he was testing for the first vulnerability. He noticed ASPX of cookie. It's a default cookie name from standard.net's form authentication class. It works this way. There is this thing called ticket which contains your data that you want to be stored inside the cookie. Usually it's data that can identify the user, for example username or user ID. First, the ticket in clear text is signed using SHA-1 algorithm. Then the whole ticket along with the signature is encrypted. And then the encrypted block is signed again using SHA-1. SHA-1 is a default algorithm for signing, while AAS is a standard encryption algorithm. The developer must set at least two keys validation key for signing and decryption key for encryption and decryption of the data. The typical flow looks like this. When you successfully log into the application, some of your data is being put in this cookie and this cookie is sent with your every request. And upon every request, the application must validate the first signature, decrypt the cookie and validate the second signature. At the end, it decodes your username or user ID from the ticket and it confirms that it's actually you. If something goes wrong along the way, you are not authenticated. Keys are sufficiently strong so that the cookie is not brute forceable. There is also no known way to disclose those keys. But the bug hunter assumed that this application is vulnerable once he saw this cookie name. Why was that? The documentation tells you to just provide the username. No user ID, no application ID, nothing like this. And what's important, your username is shared across many different applications. Is that a problem? It's not, until you use different keys for different websites. And according to the blog post, only 20% of applications do this properly and 80% of them are vulnerable. I find this number a bit hard to believe, but I have never myself tested for this vulnerability. The attack looks like this. You have application 1 to which you can't log in. It uses ASPX auth cookie to identify the user. Then you find the second application that must also use the ASPX auth cookie, but this website must allow registration. Those applications must be related, running on the same server. For this attack to work, you must know the username from user from app 1, whose account you will take over. In our case, the bug hunter brute forced the username during the first attack. Now, if validation key and decryption key are shared across those two applications, 
you can take the victim's login from app 1 and sign up using this username to app 2. After logging in, app 2 will sign your cookie and encrypt it and then sign it once again. Then you copy this cookie from app 2 to app 1. App 1 will successfully validate and decrypt the cookie because keys are shared between those applications. Then the application will take the ticket which was inside the cookie. There is no application ID that mismatches here. There is no unique user ID. There is only the username. So app 1 logs you in with that username, finishing our arbitrary account takeover. That's exactly what the hunter did here. Unfortunately, details of the second application are not disclosed in the blog post. If you are like me, right now you are wondering how did this happen that developers from such a big company just copied the keys from one app to another? But turns out they probably didn't. By default, keys are not created manually but auto-generated using machine key element. And those keys are derived from the machine properties, so if you have multiple websites running on the same server, they will have the same keys. To avoid that, you need to use isolate apps modifier, which makes the key being generated using the application ID. At least, that's what one page from the documentation says. The other page says that it only uses virtual paths. This would work if you would have one domain and one application would work under slash path and the other would work under slash app too. They would have different virtual paths, thus different keys. But in today's world, it's not the most common use case. More likely, your two applications will work on two different ports, let's say 8080 and 8081. Then you would have a reverse proxy that routes the traffic from one domain to port 8080 and the traffic to other domain to port 8081. The customer only uses port 443 on both domains. But coming back to our app isolation, both of them in such case would have slash as their virtual paths. So if isolate apps modifier was used, keys will still be exactly the same across those applications. As this is the default setting, I'd assume that's what happened with Facebook. The fix for that is changing isolate apps modifier to isolate by app ID, which actually uses the app ID. This is a typical example of insecure by default, and I wouldn't even put much blame on the developers. No way they could see this coming reading this documentation. Even for me, when I knew exactly what am I looking for, it took a few hours to dig deep to find all this information. So he could get another $7.5,000 for that. But it wasn't enough. This time he wanted to go further. He asked for permission to test for SSRFs because there was a functionality that brought his attention. API trigger. It was pretty much SSRF by design. You could make requests anywhere. Facebook gave him green light to test for this. It even has an internal endpoint that you can request to show the proof of concept of your SSRF. So he created a custom script in some editor that allowed him to make requests to arbitrary URLs but also with arbitrary headers and arbitrary methods. It's important because Facebook SSRF guidelines say that for SSRF when you can read responses, you get $40,000. But if you can control the whole request, including headers, you get 5,000 bonus. In total, he got $54,800 for those two reports. Quite a good payout if you ask me. And that's it. I myself didn't know about this ASPX auth cookie before, and even searching strictly for that, I didn't find many sources about it.
Considering that form authentication class is a part of .NET standard security module, it's probably quite common. So if you also didn't know about this, leave a like under this video. Also, sign up for my mailing list to be the first to know about any of my future projects. For now, thank you for watching and goodbye.